Uh, I just wanted to let Al and Tim know that last week there was a Alberta zone camp, uh, which means six teams selected, qualified, drafted teams from the one half of the province, three from the other, three from one the other, and we're trying to identify people who are going to eventually, in the program of excellence, become national team players. But before that, they have to become a provincial team player. So these are the best of the best at the U15 age group, I believe it was. So, Tim, the the uh, the dilemma there is, you know, the competition and the striving to be the best you can be and the ability to make it a positive experience at a camp uh, like that, where there's you know, sort of a process. Carla and Jordan were official mentors of two of the six teams. And so we have them on sharing their experience and L. So uh, Jordan, you've been mentoring uh, the longest in, in, in the group, uh, like uh, as an active mentor. And you started with boys that were U13, and uh, you moved up to the female side. And so you've worked with many different coaching staffs. And just wanted you to talk about the challenges. Okay, I'm in that leadership role, mentoring, and it's a different hat, as Carla mentioned, when I sat with her at uh, the first game I attended in, in uh, Red Deer. So go ahead, Jordan. I sure appreciate your uh, nuggets. Well, it was uh, thanks, Wally. It was a it's an interesting thing to mentor. Uh, in that, uh, when I first went into it, I was thinking that oh, I'd be helping out a little bit more with with the hockey side and the X's and O's side of things. Uh, but uh, my first few experiences of it were more in handling the and helping to manage the people uh, and. Uh, sometimes it was uh, um, more managing the adults than adult, uh, managing the children. Uh, they were the players that they were working with uh, in trying to, to uh, deal with the, the coaching staff themselves and trying to get them to come together as a group, uh, not just philosophically, but uh, but uh, actually physically sometimes that they would go poof and scatter to the wind when a game was over. Uh, or that, and, and so those were some of the challenges. Fortunately, this uh, time, the coaching staff I was working with was uh, uh, had a little more experience, uh, and philosophically, they were really close, uh, and they wanted to share with each other and, and uh, valued each other's opinions, uh, treated each other as equals uh, in the process, and, and uh, so then I was able to. Uh, do more of what uh, I would say your role, role has been, Wally, with myself as a, a mentor in asking the questions and asking some of those philosophical questions. And uh, there were some really deep conversations going on to the point where I'd have to remind them of uh, what the uh, time clock was doing in between periods so that they would be able to uh, actually head back into, uh, into the dressing room and get, get the kids regrouped and, and going out. But uh, it's an interesting uh, process uh, with it. I'm, I've been fortunate, as you said, to be on both the male and female side. And uh, as the coach mentor, I typically feel that I take away as much from the experiences as uh, they do sometimes. And it creates long, long lasting relationships in, in many cases where you continue to chat and, and talk about the things long after the short term competition. Over. Carla, I've got a sitting with you and sitting with Jordan. Jordan's staff that obviously had a lot of experience, and it it allowed him to influence, given that you know the nature of the group and uh, applying what he's learned over many years to work with them. Your staff did not have experience. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about that and how to deal with it in, in uh, moving forward in the same situation should you encounter that. 
Yeah, sure. No, I had a, I had a young staff and they had a mentor that had never officially mentored. So we were all in it together and uh, just, just working our way through it. But, um, you know, I think just to, to build a little bit on Jordan's points, like building a positive experience when I was there, I had to, I was struggling to define what was meant by that. So to, to Sammy Joe's questions in the chat, like the dance parties, um, I, I, I just thought deep down, it was the idea of building the positive experience was built around everything other than the hockey in a lot of ways. And, and I'm not sure that's ideal. Uh, just having lived it now, I think we need to, and you know me, Wally, like I'm not a massive, I'm not saying we have to sit down there and do a thousand hours worth of hockey, but I think there was, there's probably a middle ground somewhere where we could do more hockey to better help our coaches and better help the athletes understand what, what that stream looks like, you know, at the end of the day, you got to be able to do video and, and details like that. So when building the fun experience, is it a, is it a summer camp experience? Like where it's just fun and you've gone to a kid's camp or is it a little, is there, is there maybe a, an angle off of that, that finds a better balance point. So that's something that's bouncing around in my head um, because I think where we're trying to cultivate an experience for the athletes, you know, the coaches are now experiencing the same thing and nobody's truly maybe understanding the, the workload and the, the, the importance of all the variables when you're, you're, you're in that elite stream. So with my young, with my younger staff, they're phenomenal. They were, they were there for the right reasons. They were doing everything that they knew. They were very, very coachable. Um, but it didn't take me long. We had the conversation with them to realize that we weren't coaching. Uh, we, we were cheering the game and we were like a player, an extension of the player. So if we scored, we were high. And if we were struggling, we were quiet. Um, and so that was a real, a real great thing to see and, and, and talk about because then we, you know, we could flush that out and better understand that, okay, essentially we have to counter that, right? Like you got to coach the game. You got to, you got to elevate the group if they're down and love them if you need to. Um, so for, for my young coaches, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't just the art of coaching. It was actually the basics of coaching as well. So it ended up being a really valuable experience for me too, to, you talk about regression and drills. I was, you know, having regressions in coaching to be okay. What, what actually do we do? And how do you teach somebody to do that? So that was maybe one of my biggest challenges um, because I didn't want to just tell. And I just, I, you know, I was asking questions. I was, you know, you tried to explain, but we actually then had a conversation about modeling. You know, was there an opportunity for us to model as mentors? And so we were given that opportunity. And, uh, and that was an important piece for my young coaches. So they, when I said you have to coach the game, you're coaching the kids in front of you, but what they're seeing on the ice I was able to use my voice and, and help them better understand that. But uh, the experience was invaluable. Uh, I just think anytime you get to, to, to try to teach your craft uh, and teach what you do every day, it, it makes you look at it from a different lens. Um, and then to see the growth within our young coaches, uh, to go to the questioning method in the intermissions and, you know, when they were debriefing uh, the game, you know, really proud of them. They'll learn how to navigate it. You know, it's just a starting point. But I thought a lot of gains were made that way. I just think we need to push the bar uh, in our province to to continue to drive home. It's not a cheerleading club. It's it's a it's a coaching and a hockey experience. Hi, Al. Uh, we're we're. Uh, are you hearing us, Al? I hear you fine. Thank you. Good. I'm glad you got on. Uh, Carla Hell is in Minnesota, and he's been doing this as long as anybody. And uh, he's still coaching, uh, I believe, a women's team at a high school. But we're talking about mentorship, and Jordan and uh, Carla have just been through a provincial competition with eight or six zone teams. And we have six mentors, one assigned to each team. Carla and Jordan were mentoring their own teams and it was a a real good experience for them right. and, um, I think the lessons learned from it uh, are are really really important so how I have you mentored like officially been hired or brought in to mentor coaches on behalf of an asso association actually um no, I haven't. I've done it informally, uh, mostly with the young coaches that I've had on staff. And then most of them have gone on to be head coaches somewhere. Um, but, you know, Minnesota, 
our coaches think they know it all. And so, you know, I see high school coaches getting hired with one year of coaching youth hockey. But they did play and they coach, you know, so um, the art of coaching, I've written about it. It's it's a lot more than just running drills. And it's really about how do you manage the people? How do you build the relationships? And I think, as Carla was saying, you know, how do you see the game through the player's eyes and help them help them see something else? And, you know, one of the things that I've learned over the last few years is you know, making sure that I understand what the players want out of the experience. Because they, you know, as coaches, we always want to win the state tournament uh, at whatever level we're at. But the, the kids aren't always aren't always dialed into that. Um, you know, I think there's coaching girls, they want to have fun first, and they, they like the social aspect of it, um, at least in the youth levels. And But I did see a, um, uh, in a local team that when they had to hire a new coach, and the, 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 they have this thing where they go through, a lot of these schools will go through They'll bring seven or eight people into the room to interview the coach. Maybe they'll bring the football coach in and the principal, and all these people have nothing, no idea what coaching's about or, or what, um, or hockey's about. And then they all ask one question, and there's no follow-ups. And at the end of it, uh, in this one case locally, the coach said, "Well, I play to win," and they all love that. Everybody loves that idea. I play to win, so that's how. That's why he got hired. And it's like, yeah, but I saw him in action last year, and that that means is he only plays ten kids. And I think the parents on uh, the rest of the kids are going to be, be a little disappointed when they sit on the bench and watch. And this is at high school boys level now, and so I don't know. Um, we don't do a great job mentoring coaches here in Minnesota. Um, I'm, I'm afraid to say. Hell, I, uh, what I took away from what you said very early is you had coached and you were mentoring your assistants. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's, that's really what you do as a head coach. You know, in some cases, assistants know as much or more than you do. Uh, and, you know, I, I look at Peter, he's, he's got Tim Bothell, who's been a head coach on his bench and somebody else. And, Oh. Now he's got to be able to communicate and draw from their ideas, but as the head coach, draw the line of what's acceptable and make the final decisions. The yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you, Wally. It, it, it's interesting because the um, when I watch a lot of practices and even with this high school team I was with last year, the head coach he ran everything. He ran every drill. He, you know, all we did when we were practicing with them. Uh, it was, you know, basically push push cones around or push pucks around. And, you know, m my theory is if I have two assistant coaches on the ice, they need to coach. I need to let them coach. And I need to give them an assignment. I, you know, you're coaching the D, you're coaching this. And I just sit and watch. And then I will give them my, my views, um, maybe in the locker room afterwards, or kind of tell them philosophically how I think – we want to play and ask them if that, if they can, you know, be a, the, the risk in all of this is that after a while, they think they want your job. <laughs> and, and frankly, that's, you know, that's happened to me a couple of times and whatever. I mean, then you go on, there's, there's never a shortage of places to coach hockey. I can tell you that. So. That's really valid. Uh... Carla and Jordan, when uh, why do you think uh, people? This is to coach hockey. I can tell you that. So that's really valid. Uh, Carla and Jordan, when uh, why do you think uh, people volunteer for their to be a head or assistant coach in hockey Alberta's camps?
Any thoughts about why your staff took it on? I think for my my young uh, gals there, like our, our average age on our staff was about 23. Combined work experience was four years. There were four coaches. Um, obviously, COVID factors into that a little bit too. So they were they were very fresh, um, and I I think they genuinely wanted the experience of coaching more, and and having that opportunity. And you know, Hockey Alberta is doing a great job trying to further develop young female coaches uh, to to bolster that that presence in our province. And I thought all four of these women came in uh, genuinely invested in the opportunity. And for that, I'm grateful because they, they wanted to have conversations. They wanted to learn. They, they were excited to try things. Um, so, so I think their why was, was really honest and, and part of the reason why they impacted our kids then as positively as they did. Uh, and, and, you know, sticking to that process, that was another big thing we, we talked about the whole way. Cause again, so natural to be tethered to the result. Uh, so we were constantly coming back to the process or why did you feel nervous in that moment? Oh, we, we were losing. Okay, good. It's about the result, right? So just those opportunities. So, um, you know, I think everyone's why is sl slightly different, but I could say as working with them throughout the five days, well, throughout the, the time leading through it too, or into it, uh, their why was really genuine. They wanted to grow and they wanted these young, young players to have a positive experience. So for me, that was what fueled me because I was excited to work with them then. Um, well, you know, Wally, I think what's really, I was really lucky as a coach when I started because I started at the midget level and went all the way up to junior A. And then I came back down to youth level and then back up and then I did some college and then high school. But most coaches work their way up through the youth organizations. And I think the in the postseason types of camps, those opportunities, it's great for them to coach kids that are at a higher level than they've experienced coaching to see what the game looks like. Uh, at a, you know, like in Minnesota, we have these high performance uh, teams. So they're kids from nine or 10 or 12 different high schools. So it's the best kids. But in the winter, you know, we don't catch, coach the best kids. We coach the team that we have, which might have one or two of those kids. So to see the game played at a higher level with kids with, um, more experienced than, than the kids you're coaching. And if our job is to prepare players to play at the next level, it helps to know what the next level looks like what, and how those kids prepare and how they think about the game, that type of stuff. Then you can bring that down and keep what you're doing in perspective um, rather than just win, baby, win. Maybe we need to teach the third line how to skate a little bit better because they could very well in two years, be a very valuable player on, on the next level. Up. So I think that's a, a that's a benefit. I'm not sure that the coaches show up with that in mind. But I um, and then, of course, it's the highly coveted H, HP jacket with the logo on it that, you know, that everybody wants to wear in the off season. <laughs> I think Carla had a couple of things that I want to comment on. Uh, to get these young coaches to do the legwork and spend the hours on the ice and the games, that, to, to have a bigger sample size before you know the game and stick to what you're doing instead of just being a cheerleader, like a little older than the players. It's, I think the mentoring has to point out what is this game about? There are some really fun things. I have a young coach there. Yep, I asked, what do you want to do? I want to coach the power play and then offensive face-offs. Okay, you can do that, but there are other aspects of the game that is not so maybe the fun part. Like, And you have to be able to do that too. And then also, when I was in North Dakota, where we uh, went for an assistant coaches, there were so many young, young coaches who said, I can learn so much from you. But when you come to that high level, no, you're going you're gonna to teach us some things that you're going to teach the players. So to do the legwork, to be prepared to be a professional coach, is not done in three years and you played a couple of years yourself. It's like a 10 to 50 years process before you start knowing this, a little other things you should know 
and it's maybe 30 years before you're fully learned and hope the memory don't slip while you're getting too old like mine. And, and I would agree, Peter, and I think, you know, one of the challenges is, is, you know, this was a really small snippet and, and my line I used the entire duration was they don't know what they don't know. So you talk about doing the, the prep work and stuff, they don't, they don't quite know what they're supposed to be looking for or doing. So one of the, one of the recommendations we put forward as a mentor group to Hockey Alberta is, you know, maybe from this event, we, we figure out who are the four or five coaches that, you know, are really sinking their teeth into it and have have the opportunity to, to grow, you know, can they align with uh, youth sport or ACAC coaches or, or the mentors that were there, but can we maintain the mentorship throughout the season? Because that's really, you, you need that time um, for them to understand what you're dealing with throughout a season and how do you deal with all of it. Now, short term is kind of glorified in a lot of ways. It's, it's expedited in a lot of ways. So it's a roller coaster, but you know, you can, you can gloss over a lot because the end of the events there before you blink. Um, so, you know, I think it's just laying that foundation, but they don't know what they don't know is the biggest thing that I kept coming back to. And so just trying to inform them of, have you thought of this? Have you considered that, you know, that that was kind of the biggest thing. And, you know, they definitely came away with more, but I think there's that next step is you know, wholeheartedly investing them as young coaches as they work through their seasons now. And in a perfect world, you get them in as assistant coach, uh, I think, but sometimes those aren't the options or it's not available. So just trying I to... Yeah, right support yeah. i i have one recommendation when you mentor like and i'm telling all my young coaches you have to study the game you have to go and watch hockey games you have to have all even if it goes to your wallet you have to pace you have those nhl games you have to watch the swedish you have to watch a lot of hockey to understand it you need to listen on podcast and you have to follow the think tank you, you have to educate yourself I have an 18 year old who could go to university and study dinosaurs because he spent probably 20,000 hours in the age between four to 15 on studying, doing dinosaur things. And if you want to be a really good hockey coach, you have to spend the hours. It's a complicated game and it's not going to be easier. You have to do the legwork as a coach on the ice and as to study to understand what's happening here. And I think this younger generation it's a lot of work, so you should find the five best who is ready to log the log the hours because they're going to be the best coaches in the end. Carla, could you you told me the story of being on the bench and at the end of the game where you were more active and mentoring them actively? Uh, I think that connects here with Peter's just said. I wonder if you could share that story. Well, I've got the same problem as Peter. I can't remember everything I've said. So if I've forgotten the story, Wally, backfill it for me, please. Okay. Um, but yeah, as, as alluding to it there, my, my last conversation was, you know, trying to model what what do we need? And, uh, you know, and, and it comes so naturally, I guess, to, to a lot of us that have been around the game for as long and, and your personality factors. And I was saying in the chat to Sammy, you know, that was one of my big challenges as a mentor to not project my personality style onto the coaches. They don't have to do what I do, um, but just try to get them to think of things of what they could do within their own realm. But yeah, we were we were just struggling on the bench a little bit. We were a little bit uncomfortable, weren't quite sure. Really good at giving individual feedback, trying hard that way. Uh, but just again, bringing that presence that, that coaches can bring and how you can impact a game with your presence, not, not yelling and screaming, but coaching a game, teaching the the coaches and the players how to see the game. What are we celebrating? You know, was it the angle to contact? Was it the, the stick lift? Like, what were the variables we were looking for? And then just using our presence and our voice and our and our energy to get them excited about those things and, you know, subtle little corrections on the bench. Oh, we flew by there, right? We got to make contact. We've talked about that. So just showing them how to, hopefully showing them how to just engage your group throughout. To, to, to Like, those are the most teachable moments. You know, if you sit quiet in a game, you've lost a good opportunity to, to help those young athletes grow, especially in short term, because they're coming from different lenses. Um, so trying to get them on the same page as quick as you can. But yeah, again, just just understanding as to Peter's point, like what it takes. So what was really cool was we had this goal going into our fourth game of, hey, we're going to 
counter the energy on our bench. We're going to, if they're high, we're going to make sure they're ready for the next shift. If they're low, we're going to lift them up. And it was cute because after the game, I said to them, I was deeper. I said, well, how did that one feel? And they said, we are exhausted. And I said, congratulations, you've coached your first game. So I said, the muscle memory will come along with that as you continue to do it. But that was their first time they were wholeheartedly engaged in a game, trying to feel what their team needed. And that was a pretty cool thing to hear and, and have them experience. So, you know, that, that again, those are just the little things you try to help them with. So they go back to their club teams next year. Hopefully they've got a little more confidence in that realm. Call it. That was really glad to say the, the, your coaches said they were totally drained after one full game. And in this coaching profession, if you go to the big tournaments, you're going to coach. You coach the game who ends at 10 o'clock and you have to do a video, you have to prepare because you're going to play three o'clock the next day. And being at a lot of those big events, you're drained for a month. You, you're so tired, you shouldn't do anything. So, so to, to point that out for young coaches, it, it's uh, not just one game because you have one game tomorrow morning. You have to be just as good. And that was a great point, Peter. Uh, Peter. And that's what we brought up to Hockey Alberta as well is they didn't give us access to video. Like it was, we could have purchased it with, with an online, but they didn't provide video. And I was, you know, you think again about coaching and preparing for that next day. Like you're right. You're up till two in the morning working on that video to show so they just had a snippet that that's like one piece of what coaching is just the on the bench piece. But, you know, in that short term, at least there was some gains made there, but I, I wholeheartedly agree, Peter, like, you know, the volume. And the one thing I said to the group early on was anything we do with this team, anything has to come from our brains and has to be facilitated by us. And I think that was a little bit overwhelming for them to understand that. Cause they're like, yeah, we'd love to have, you know, our green signs in our room. I was like, well, we'd all love it. Who's going to do it? You know, and I think that was another piece of just, you know, right. Nothing's, nothing just happens. It's all cultivated from, from us as a group, as a staff. So, you know, those are, those were the variables that I thought were interesting and hopefully, you know, they walked away a little bit more, a little bit better tool set than they came in with a little better understanding. I think really good your point because it, it's a do or do not. Like if you want to be that coach who's going to have this profession get paid to do it, you 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 have to make a decision. This is what I'm going to do, and it's not the 40-hour work week. It's 80 hours, 20 hours. It it's also your social life. You need to have a social life, but it's not the normal social life. It's it's based on what you're doing. Uh, just something I wanted to add, um, mentoring in communities, double-A, uh, triple-A, uh, there are four quadrants and I've been in, worked with two different uh, associations. <clears throat> and I evaluate for Hockey Alberta, the HP1 program. So <clears throat> my biggest concern, oh, being on the bench for a period and just watching and you can see it in uh, five minutes and possibly three shifts. Can the coach see the game? Are they able to point out the most important things that are happening and respond to them? Do they see the game? And uh, I've worked with Jordan many years ago uh, when he was working with the Bantam team, and he saw the game. And he communicated really well. So it wasn't, but I'm finding there are some coaches, and they may be assistants on the bench, that don't see the game. So they don't know what to say and how to say it. So there's an awful lot of learning to understand the game and the nuances and the cardinals of playing the game the right way and reinforcing that by identifying positive specific form performance as a coach versus screaming and yelling and getting frustrated. So uh, I just wanted to share that. And Jordan, over the many years that you've done it with Hockey Alberta, how did, you know, in terms of the ability to see the game, 
how how would you say the different staffs you worked with over the years might have been? Well, it's uh, that's an interesting question, Molly, because the, each of the staffs that I've worked with have been totally different. Um, in that uh, we've had people, well, one one assistant coach that had over 900 games in in the NHL uh, on the bench to people who are just stepping out of hockey themselves, playing at the elite level, not much higher than the kids themselves, um, to a, a video coach uh, that had never even spent time on a bench. Um, so it's all different people. But uh, yeah, I've had the experience that you said as well, Wally, where some see the game very well. Uh, you can tell by the comments that they're making to the kids. Uh, and then you've had some that uh, they may as well be sitting in the stands with the parents because they're basically a spectator and they're just, they're, they're, they're just the emotion in the game is up and down about what's happening. So it's not uh, necessarily uh, um, one world, but it's, I think that again, using the, the questioning piece with them uh, and helping them uh, see the game a little better that uh, like Carla mentioned, it's, it's hard work and they will get there uh, with time, but they have to put in that time, effort and energy. And whether it's watching a lot of hockey, um, you know, when you say, I, I see the game, well, I, I say that that's because I wasn't that good of a player. And to get to the levels that I played at, I had to be a student of the game and had to know what uh, everyone on the ice had to do because if one of my line mates screwed up, I had to be able to cover for them so we didn't get scored on so I could see another shift. Uh, so that, that's those pieces. But uh, with, with this competition and that, it's helping people see the game um, and that. So and you've said a lot when you say that it's about providing that reinforcement to the kids, whether it's positive specific or whether it's corrective. Uh, but that's what the majority of it is uh, about through the short term competition is helping them be able to get to that point as well. Um, so, but uh, one other thing, uh, just a, a side note uh, that Carla had mentioned in, in earlier, and you piqued uh, my memory with it there was, uh, uh, and I know we've had this conversation many times about how players are evolving. Uh, well, coaches are evolving too in the, their needs, uh, and we have to also understand. Uh, I'm right now in the hiring process of uh, uh, new teachers for next school year, and uh, it's one of those things that uh, we have to be aware of their needs as we're hiring them, um, and uh, so we know we can support them, and and that piece. So that's the, the piece with coaches, and uh, we talk about all of the the needs uh, growth wise and this mentorship piece is such a huge one and uh, what Carla had mentioned about uh, keeping it going longer than the short term competition I think is really key uh, and well I know that you've been a, a formal informal mentor of mine for a lot of years Wally and, and uh, it's finding that person that fits for you and it's not necessarily the person that always agrees with everything you say but uh, sometimes it's that person asking the tough questions and, and holding up a mirror every once in a while for you to be able to slap yourself in the forehead and go, what the heck was I thinking? But uh, that's, that's what it, it's about and it's a growth. And uh, the other piece that uh, we were chatting about that we're seeing with players uh, and it's also with coaches as well. And well, with my teachers, we were talking about it before in, in self-care and uh, mental health support and uh, it's we've, we've gone from a generation of rub some dirt on it keep going or it's a long way from your heart uh, but it's uh, one of those things that we have to be aware of and, and supporting one another because we know better we have to do better and that's uh, that's a pretty important piece when dealing with the adults and youth so uh, uh, I'll stop talking now and let somebody else chat. Jordan, it's it's interesting that you say that I have to really study and learn the game and doing that. Uh, my wife is Canadian. She never played hockey late, maybe, but she was a figure skater. And she said one day, hockey is so random. 
it's so random. You don't know what's going to happen. I said, no, it's not random. There's patterns. If they go down there, of course, the puck is going to go there. So she said, no, it's random. So I said, you sit beside me and we would just watch a game like, like a school class, like one hour. And we just see, what do you see? And I see this is going to happen. I look around the corners and she said, that hour just sitting and watching the game, not sharing for a team or like being a bench, of just see how the game developed, opened her eyes that, ah, now it's like almost you get into a math test. You don't have a formula book with you. And the next time you get the formula book and it's, yeah, that's not so hard. So I think that we can mentor our coaches, not just being on the bench, but sit beside them. And you and I are going to watch for an hour here. Then we we'll take a cup of coffee and just see what do you see and I see a little more because I, I have my 62 years of background and I'm not 22. I've, I've, I've done it with some of my young coaches and it's a great advice. Maybe they get conflicted with what you see a lot in that, what they're going to look for. You're, you're, player, you're looking for nice passes and player patterns and another guy would look for the big hits, but it, it's, it's a good way to get them to watch more hockey in an educational way and not just being a cheerleader. And it's not a random game. Everything is set up almost. 90% is going, you know what's going to happen. If you can look around corners and you're good. Peter, I, I'm just holding up this book. Uh, so Corbett wrote, I had this book and I purchased it for all of my family members. Uh, it's just a classic book. And I turn to this chapter on mentorship. It's not a chapter. It's just that one page. And I, I think the, the bottom line to mentorship is, like Carla said, they don't know what they don't know. And do they want to learn? How can we inspire them, their curiosity to learn? And uh, she writes about the importance of this. And the fact that the experience that we all have that they may not have is something that they can gain from. Now, it works at Hockey Alberta events. I'm not so sure it works on an ongoing basis when it's prescribed when associations hire a mentor. At least that's my experience. And uh, I was hoping that some of you would, would have gone through that mentorship experience, you know, formal hired, you're there to help, I shouldn't say change the world, but influence the way coaches coach. But I found it to be extremely difficult uh, at the community level when it's assigned. When it occurs organically, like Hal alluded to, his assistants, he was mentoring them, uh, when it occurs at Hockey Alberta, it's an approved, prescribed, formal way, which is received well. Um, I I believe that the mentor is, is just got a lot to offer, and uh, how how are we able to share that? How are we able to get it across in a in a better way? Because some mentors. Uh, and uh, maybe didn't really treat their players very well, even at the Hockey Alberta competition, just by not playing them when they shortened the bench. And I, I think that there's sort of cardinals in mentorship. And at Hockey Alberta, one of the cardinals is you play everybody in all situations. And uh, if that doesn't occur at those things, that's a cardinal that needs to be addressed. Um, I watched uh, one team do a dry land walk through outside before their third game of D zone cover. And I, the question I had wearing my experience hat was, is this the right time and the right stuff and the right amount of uh, the right stuff, right amount and the right time to do that? And I think those are the areas as a mentor that you, you want to be comfortable with recognizing, addressing, asking questions about, and Carla, you do a tremendous job uh, on the questioning piece. And is there a better way to do that? Or what would you do differently? So 
uh, I think everybody on here is plays a leadership role wherever they live, and you're you're mentoring every day. And one of the things that Syl in her book alludes to is that <clears throat> you learn as much from the experience as a person being mentored, probably more because you're more open to learning. And I'm sure there's a stage at which you think you go in and you know it all and they've got to do this. But the art of mentoring is the same as the art of coaching and learning to ask questions and the right stuff, the right amount, the right time. Uh, it's the same with mentoring. And it, hopefully it can make a, bi a big difference down the road. So now I talked to Syl Corbett uh, and she did a... Uh, I don't think you were on Tim or Hal, but she did a presentation on this book that I held up in front of you. And Dr. Corbett has just a brilliant uh, person, a former Olympic athlete. I, I'm not sure whether she was a distance runner or a cyclist, but she has a, a doctoral degree in neuroscience. And this book is such a great read she does her artwork. She's an artist, and every chapter has a work of her art as a title to the chapter, and they're all very humorous related to the particular chapter. So the one she did on mentorship, and Carla, maybe you can help me on this. It's called No Small Potato. I'm not sure what that means related to mentorship. <laughs> And I guess it's a big job. What do you? How do you take that artwork, Carla? I I don't know. I don't know, Wally. Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to ask her. But I, uh, when I spoke to her yesterday, I I called her because I knew we were going to try to spend time on it this weekend. And I I said you could write a book on it, and she said probably. This book, incidentally, is 76 pages of the actual chapters, very short chapters, and 56 pages, uh, just a list of all the resources, the references that she used. So it's it's really a great read, and uh, hopefully she'll be able to come on with us. And, um, takeaways moving forward. Um, Peter, you're, uh, I think you're, we're always mentoring whether we are officially or not. It's just sort of an osmosis process that occurs when two people talk together and exchange ideas. But is there anything that any of you can offer and share from all of your experiences to people who are, uh, want to become, better coaches and maybe be more yeah, I, to learning. Go ahead. I, I have one quote that I use a lot. It's nice to be important, but more important to be nice. That means that as a head coach, you're the most important person, but you, you have to have a staff and players that believe in you, trust in you. And the only way that they can do that is that you believe in them and so, um, well, one of the things, Wally, I was just going to uh, comment on was you were talking about uh, the community association mentorship versus uh, short-term competition in, or the prescribed piece. Yeah. Um, what I've found in having someone prescribed to me as part of a, an association, uh, it was kind of like the, and I know that this isn't a, a something that any of us want to talk about, but the inoculation approach, a vaccination, one shot, it seems like you had one or two or three shots through the season uh, where a person was uh, coming out to work with you, uh, as opposed to informal mentorship where you found somebody that uh, uh, is a fit for you and uh, somebody that you can call to be that sounding board, somebody that you can uh, engage in coming to be a part of your program. Uh, and I find that, the, that there's learning in both. 
but the uh, learning in the prescribed model of uh, one with an association just seems like it's a little disjointed. Uh, sometimes it's on the uh, agenda or time frame of the mentor rather than you, whereas uh, when you have an informal mentor or somebody that, that uh, you've selected yourself, uh, that it always seems like it's ongoing and it's what you need uh, at that time. Jordan, if you uh, ask, you know, I'm, I'm approaching the association to possibly mentor three coaching staff. And I, I think in terms of your suggestion, I might ask them who would they want to mentor them? Who do they know that they trust and respect enough to uh, engage in helping them become better coaches? And uh, that. That's a good thought. I think the they already trust people. Uh, they confide in them and believe in them. So they're likely going to listen to them and apply what's shared and exchanged. Um, and that, that may be something that just dawned on me when you mentioned it, that uh, you're hiring a mentor. Please find one that suits you your needs and personality, and it's sort of an expectation of the organization that you reach out and uh, continue a relationship that will be ongoing uh, for you know for all, all the time that you coach. You'll establish a, a trust, respect, and friendship, like, much like uh, the relationship we've developed, Jordan. And uh, obviously, when we began. Uh, I believe you were coaching the rural AAA team, and Bobby Joel was uh, loser was involved, and uh, that helped bridge the gap of communication because I wasn't a total stranger. Bobby Joel trusted and respected me, but over time our relationship really improved. Um, I similarly admitted Tom Malloy officially, and my role. Uh, primarily was to protect Tom and Jordan from the outside uh, musings that were going on, uh, the criticisms that were just not valid, and protecting the coach so they could enjoy the process. So um, I, I really believe, uh, Jordan, that that idea of, you know, find your own mentor, uh, I think is a good idea. I wonder if it's possible. Tim, in your, do you have a mentor, Tim Taylor? No. Okay. If is there anyone you would find if you were asked to find one for yourself? Um, I mean here locally. Yes. Yes. Somebody that's realistically you could connect with. Converse with. Yeah, I'm, I, there isn't a name that's popping into my head right now, but there's some good hockey people around, so I'm, I'm sure that there is. And, uh, I guess that's the point of my question is, and I don't know, Hal, are you still on? See, I, I think um, when I began coaching, I assisted Dave King with the national team as a head coach, and I considered him my mentor. I didn't say that. I was just his assistant coach, but I just took such a value out of what he did that, boy, it became a part of how I coached. And at Hockey Alberta, at the program of excellence camps, the way they ran before, Claire Drake and George Kingston uh, – I regard as highly respected people in the game. And I was fortunate enough to be involved at that level, working with them. And so I called them mentors. And they're the kind of people that I I could phone and did phone. And I didn't call and phone them for advice. I often called and phone them just to talk hockey. And that that's mentorship. So I want to thank you all for coming on. And uh, I'm hoping to arrange to have 
Dr. Sil Corbett uh, with a degree in neuroscience talking about mentorship and it, its importance and possibly how to make it more possible, more viable. 